Welcome to Design Dispatches, where every Saturday I'll be talking to major designers and architects across the design community. And today I'm delighted to say I'm going to be joined by Bella Freud, who is the British fashion designer who set up her own brand, her own fashion house in 1990 after a brief stint working with Vivian Westwood, and who for the last 30 years has been producing an exquisite brand of upmarket irreverence her website's description, not mine, but I think it's very, very astute. And at the same time, 70s inspired, but always with a contemporary twist. Bella, you come from um, a very cultivated, literary, artistic family. Um, I wonder what your own cultural landscape is now during the lockdown. What are you reading, for example? Um, I'm reading, in fact, I finished it last night, this book called on Earth Where Briefly Gorgeous by a, a young writer called Ocean Vuong. He's Vietnamese American. And it's such a good book and I slowed it right down to make it last as long as possible. And um, he's a poet and this is a kind of memoir novel. And I find it, you know, I find it quite hard to read new writers. I like to just go back to old things that I know I love, but this, this was totally captivating and the way he uses language is very unusual and completely easy as well to to engage with and language is something that I find uh, I think it's the most important thing in the world because it's everything and uh, so I've been losing myself in in that book and uh, I, yeah now I need to get his poem so I can carry on kind of being with him in my head. It's very interesting you talk about language because we can see that you're surrounded by uh, your own designs, Je t'aime Jane, Ginsberg is God, uh, 1970 we can see. And these are phrases, numbers that you have, have used in your designs almost since the beginning, they've become a kind of signature. Um, is there a poetic element to design for you? Yeah, I, I usually start with a word. Well, I often start with a word and, and I draw my words out and then I see whether they work as a, as a design as well as something that operates on its own, really. I don't, I don't ever want to write something that's a, uh, like a, an order or a cute thing. Well, it can be cute, but I don't want to tell people what to do at all. And I like the idea that something can mean whatever, to whoever's reading it, like Ginsburg is God. I remember this woman asking me if that was Ginsburg in, in Petticoat Lane. And just, I love, I love that. It doesn't have to be kind of an, a dictum at all. And, um, and also words are so evocative and especially right now when we're so restricted, everything is, you know, most of my life is spent in my room where I am now in my flat but and uh, so these things become I don't know they just mean they have maybe more depth or resonance or something but when we read of course we we see the word on the page and we hear it and Ginsburg is God sounds good provocative comic there's a sort of element of profundity but you try and work out quite what that is but also the look of words because it's how words look for you in your design as well well i've been always interested for some reason in like posters protest posters and album covers when when i was growing up i i went to a steiner school so we had no tv no radio even and i used to spend a lot of time looking in the window of the local record shop and you know i spent hours looking at brian ferry's Roxy music album with the, the woman in the pale blue, in fact, Anthony Price outfit with a lot of blue eyeshadow, just trying to work it out. What does this mean? Why am I so drawn to it? Is it good or not? What does that mean about me? And, and then Bob Marley and lyrics and, and then protest posters when somebody, the sort of aesthetics of protest, I'm, um, I love that and, and, you know, black power and just symbols that when you don't have very much, those symbols are everything. And when someone is encroaching on your identity, that's, 
all you have and it's just so important and I like to connect with that atmosphere and see how much I can intensify into one word and then just let it go sort of lightly and see what kind of what happens I'm interested in your identity because your your sister is a is a um, a respected serious writer your father is one of the great painters of the last century when did you realize that your identity was tied up in fashion design or design um, well, I have three sisters who are writers, in fact, Esther Freud, Susie Boyd and Rose Boyd. And language has been, I, my father was, even though English was his second language, he, he was very kind of, very specific with his descriptions. And I'm sure that had an effect on me. But um, with, I don't know. I mean, I started designing almost, I was always interested in music and then about, and then I became a designer and I always thought that music was my first love and I'd never really kind of had the courage to go into that world. And then about five years ago, I suddenly thought, actually, maybe designing is my, maybe this is, <laughs> this is what I wa want to be. And uh, I know how, I feel like I know what I'm doing. It's like being a cook. I, I can go into my particular kitchen and I know how to make something. And that's a very freeing and it kind of open-ended feeling. And now my identity is so consolidated, really. If I'm not really making, if I'm not doing something to do with making something, I feel like I'm evaporating. So especially now when it's so weird and sometimes I just don't know what I'm doing really. And there's this kind of extra space. I know I, if I can just get back to my notebook and mess about somehow within it, I'll get to the next phase, the next hour, whatever that happens to be. So is your process, it, it often starts with a, an idea in a notebook, that's the beginnings? Yeah, it often starts with reading, so I, I, can, I can get more visuals from reading sometimes than looking and mind you i don't really have a, a strict process so but i noticed like when i first started i i read this book about chanel and the things that she described stayed very much with me and influenced me right in the beginning color choices and the names of colors and things like that but um now i i um i I have this notebook and I put everything in it, even if it's notes to my lawyer or, you know, drawing little t-shirts or writing dreams, it all goes in. And then sometimes I go back over them, but there's something about the act of, of drawing that manifests it. And then it's something to, to review. And that's the beginning of, of the shaping. I read that you 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 did you trained as an artist for a time, but knew from very early on that you didn't want to be an artist. But there's a kind of collaboration with different art forms that that, that informs a lot of design, and I'd imagine yours in particular. Yeah, I never trained as an artist. I knew that was no way from the start. Um, it seemed so difficult, painting or drawing. That's why I find if I can draw a word, I know how to do that. It's a bit like being at school and writing small things in a particular way that makes them more than what they are, just the note. Um, yeah. You, you mentioned reading a book on Coco, Coco Chanel. Um, was, was she the first designer who had an impact on you? Was she the most, the, 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 one of the earliest influences? Yeah, she was the first kind of real designer, I suppose after just looking around and seeing what people were wearing in my life um, or pop stars and stuff like that. But I read this book about her and I was completely spellbound and sort of admiring and her whole life, everything, the way she used everything in her life it, and, and put it into her work, you know, 
the things that men were wearing that she would adapt. And I found that very interesting. I was always interested in boys' clothes. I always wanted to be a boy, not really, but I liked the way boys dressed and things, just ordinary things like the way that underpants showed above their waistband and things like that I found incredibly glamorous and that I suppose the simplicity of their uniform I was always interested in uniform and I I, I still am I like that edit that within you can be kind of wild or it can be unraveled somehow or other and um and she did that a lot um it, it, she did that in her work what about Vivian Westwood? What, what did you learn from, from Vivian when you worked for her uh, as an assistant for a time? Um, I think, God, I, I, I pretty much learned everything about how to function as in the world of design, even though it was very different. And uh, also to, you know, because she would often start with something and I couldn't see where it was going. And then at the end, there it was in, in its total beauty. And so I learned to be patient with how an idea emerges and to never be satisfied and always go beyond really, you know, what feels comfortable. I, I learned that a lot from watching my father working too when I, I used to sit for him a lot and he would often like reach some kind of an impasse or be clearly frustrated by it not going well in his eyes and and he always persevered so those lessons have been good not to not to kind of throw the whole thing out of the window or abandon it or give up being a designer but I think part of being having any kind of getting anywhere in whatever you're doing is tenacity and I've got lots of that. How are you finding working space? Um, you know, we're all in lockdown. How have you had to amend the physical space or spaces in which you work? Well, not the thing I miss is I miss touching fabrics. I miss when we kind of gather together with the people I work with and look through things or feel things. And we can't do that at the moment, except no, we can't do that. But Strangely, it's not as difficult as I imagined. Um, a lot of it is still to do with talking and we have these, you know, these computer online meetings and discussions and things and they're, they're really productive. Um, the whole spark thing can still happens and then, you know, we were right in the middle of, we'd finished a collection and started another one. So all those things are there and you just have to rely on your memory, which is much more reliable than I realise. I'm glad yours is. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, you, you mentioned music being really important uh, early on. What are you listening to now and, and how have your tastes changed musically? Um, my taste, they haven't changed that much really probably since I was a teenager, I still listened to, you know, when I discovered Bob Marley, I still love reggae. And then um, I, I, I listened to Nick Cave a lot. He's my favorite artist and I've been listening to his new album incessantly. And, um, and then I found sort of weird things under lockdown, like somebody told me about a DJ called D Nice who plays these long sessions for nine, I don't know where he is, in, in America somewhere. And he does these live DJing sets and hundreds of thousands of people are kind of, you know, doing whatever they're doing while he's playing. And so I've heard some good music on his, you know, old soul tunes and newish things. And it's nice to get a new song from an unexpected source. Um, but I, yeah, I play music all the time and it, 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 it really cheers me up. So, um, do you work to music? Do you work with music on in the background or speech or not? Not much actually, because in a way I get distracted by music if I'm trying to work and I need, 
I prefer silence or I'll play something, you know, kind of a bit boring or banal, like the police or something like that, or <laughs> something that I, I, you know, I like, but I don't love, I don't want to fall in love with the music while I'm working or I'll, I'll not be able to work. It's that reggae rhythm. It just puts you into a trance, does it? Well, if I, if I listen to reggae, then I'll want to sort of skank about in my city, <laughs> <laughs> be silly and get really into it. It's so, you know, it's a, it's a real call to, to action reggae music. The words are great. The beat is, you know, it's very enlivening. Um, I, I like it for those things. What about Patty Smith? Yeah, Patty, I mean, Patty Smith is just, you know, mainline stuff. She's, um, I, I listen to her selectively because she's such a kind of important person in my life that I'll really choose carefully when I, I need, I need her kind of thing. Um, I've had a, one or two meetings with her and she performed twice for for the charity that I'm a co-founder of called the Hoping Foundation and so she feels to me like some kind of spirit that she will come in and she will make it happen and be something very very significant um, and I've read all her books and yeah, she's, she's pretty important to me. I really like the idea that one rations that which is really important because repetition, although it can be helpful and meditative, it can sometimes undermine or, or, or diminish the importance of something. I, I also queued up Patty Smith because I'd read that you had a, I mean, I, I knew that you'd met her, but I read that you had a dream uh, about her in 2008. And this is, <laughs> this is for public consumption because it's, again, you, you published it or it's on your website where you ended up nicking her shoes, but you actually took part in a gig with her. Just, just take us through the dream. And I also want to know if you're dreaming more vividly now in lockdown, because I certainly am. Well, I always dreamt a lot. I remember dreams from sort of 30, 35 years ago and things and, and my recurring nightmares as a child. But that dream was a kind of, a kind of anxiety nightmare where I was, I was on stage playing with Patti Smith and because I was on, she wasn't able to play with some brilliant bass guitarist and I'd taken their place. I can't play the bass guitar, I've never. Um, and then somehow I just kept messing everything up. And at the end, everyone just sort of withdrew from me and disappeared. And they obviously were so disappointed that I was there and I'd messed the thing up on top of, I hadn't been a sort of fluke genius. And then I was backstage and I saw these shoes and I put them on and then she icily asked me if I could give her shoes back and I realised I'd messed, I'd done some further faux pas, I mean, just idiotic thing. And um, anyway, this dream I remembered in, in every little excruciating detail. And then I was, I must've been looking through something ages ago and I found it. And, uh, and sometimes I put things on my website, sort of, you know, stories or whatever. And I, it was so funny. <laughs> anyway, it was kind of, yeah. Do you write your dreams down then in the morning or when you wake up? Do you note them? I often do. Um, sometimes I can't be bothered or, but when they come out, yeah, I, I often do because I like remembering them and then thinking about them. And, and I notice that they, I'll forget a detail and some of them are, I like looking back over dreams as well. Um, and sometimes they come out and I just know I'll never forget them. Um, tiny little sort of snippets, but... Um, have you dreamed design? I remember talking to the sculptor Anthony Cara who said he didn't dream his sculptures, but he did have dreams where he argued with Picasso and Matisse and somehow it was informing yeah. what he was doing. God, I wish I'd dreamt design more, but I, I remember only one dr dream where, and that was about 20 years ago, and I dreamt about some knitwear that I designed, and it was this kind of 
beautiful dark almost like purpley red and it had a little Peter Pan collar in pale blue gray and I kept trying to make this in real life but it just didn't have the it was almost like you know when you're walking through a wood and you see some colors they are there they work but when you try and reproduce it, it looks completely banal but um very very rarely I normally if I dream about design I have a running order nightmare which is the running order is when you have the order of how things will come out when they go onto the catwalk. I haven't done a show for years and years, but um, in my dreams, the running order is always, sometimes it's always wrong. It's always the, the models will come out and they're wearing things that I've never seen before that I don't understand how they got there. And then I'm not sure whether they, then I think, if they're good maybe maybe that's all right and but they're never good or they're kind of calico things um half made everything it's they're the most distressing dreams anyway i hope i never have one again so why aren't you doing catwalk shows why did you make a decision sometime back not to do them well i they require an enormous amount of energy and a very particular kind of shaping. And every time I did one, I felt like it was just putting all my effort into something that wasn't there in the end. And I, I felt kind of demoralized by the whole thing. And, and then I, I decided to make films instead. And in fact, I'd, I'd started, when I first started my label, I, I'm, I made some films in 1991 and I've always been sort of vaguely interested. I thought it would be easier, but it's a whole other set of difficulties. But what I liked about it was that at the end of it, it was still there and it was the shape that I wanted it to be. And, um, and so then I started doing more films and, and sort of collaboratives. Like I made these three films with John Malkovich and um, I really enjoyed doing that. And I liked, the collaborative element that I went to him with my story about the collection and then he brought his story to it which was often couldn't have been more different and somehow or other they turned into something and and I like now I I like doing that I like taking the collection and putting it into it's really hard to put it into words, but I want it to, to be on film. I feel I can get my message over better. And it sounds a bit kind of like, what is the message? I don't even know myself. But by the time I finish the film, I know exactly what I want it to be. And when I do shoots and stuff, like I do a lookbook shoot, but I treat that almost like a mini film that it's a, it's a story and there are particular kind of poses, like there are things you always remember in films, kind of moments where people are talking or, I don't know, like little gatherings or poses or whatever. And I like to include that. It's interesting because it, there's, there's something about scale for me is that there's, I mean, you have an international reputation, but there's an intimacy in, what you have produced and the scale at which you operate i mean it's global but at the same time you're still a small operation that's centered very much around you and your creative vision is that is that fair observation i think the thing of intimacy is definitely true and it's i think that's when i feel like something's working when there's a direct line to it and that's always to do with a feeling and so maybe that goes back to the film that it it's a way of maintaining that. And I didn't ever feel I could do that in a show. Some people are brilliant at it. And I didn't feel like I was, I got, I didn't able, I wasn't able to do what I wanted somehow. I don't know what that was, but I, I, can, I can do that with films and like setups and stuff. And, uh, and I think the feeling of intimacy is really exciting and it's always, like the music, you know, like listening to Nick Cave and things, I, I get, you know, I get that. It's my 
my hit and you know patty smith it's a it's the same kind of thing and it's just different it different with different artists you know that's how i like to listen to her with nick cave i'm a massive fan so i like to listen to that and i i never ever get bored of it um, but, uh, we, we haven't got too long left and I, I just want to sort of just change emphasis for a moment because one of the things I, I want to do uh, in design dispatches, uh, dispatches is to ask individuals if there's an object or something that's close to them that means something to them that, in, in the way that it's designed or, or, and the associations it has. Do you have an object that you can share with us? Well, the thing that really means something to me is always my my notebook my sketchbook which i mean it's not can you see the right yeah. and i always write something or rather on on the front so i remember i've got tons and tons of them and uh but even though this one started in february but what comes out of that season is christmas it's like all about what people are going to wear at christmas and then um i don't know like these are um, what is it? You know, it's a mixture of writing and um, um, just sort of. And are they always a particular kind of notebook, or will you, would you have a range of different styles? Are all your notebooks of the last ten years that that format? Yeah, they're mostly they're this this make called Postal Co. It's a Jap It sounds very niche, and it is actually. It's a Japanese um make and i have to get them sent from japan and they have this tiny grid you can't really see but it's like um it's a tiny tiny grid grid on it and i find that drawing things onto it they look really good on that type microscopic sort of check thing everything seems to look better so once i figured that i liked my drawings when they were on that particular paper then I I ordered loads of them and um, and so and then they made this white one which is my favourite now so I've rather given up on the colours and I like this this kind of hessian white and um, it's yeah that's I never go anywhere without that. The the story of your the, your logo when you asked your father whose handwriting you you loved to write your name and then he he famously drew a dog, the whippet that you've given him that he often painted. Do you have that, uh, do you keep that sketch? Have you got that? I lost it. Really? I want... <laughs> it's like the most painful thing. I, I, I don't know. I, I had it somewhere and then I don't know where. I never saw it again, so I don't know. I hope somebody stole it because at least it still exists, but... Um... Well, it exists in numerous forms on numerous yeah. items of clothing everywhere, doesn't it? On this cushion, even like <laughs> it's really of all. You know, I often look through his work, thinking, "God, there must be something there I can use," and there isn't. The the thing that really worked as a knit, as a print, was that dog, and the other. All his work is far too much art. It doesn't translate into an immediate sort of it, it's not a design at all so and i'm sure that's exactly how he would have liked it too um but the dog is brilliant it, it you know it's everywhere it is um what advice would you have to young designers now who are uh, who are trying to make their way in in the design world in the circumstances that we find ourselves in now it's always really hard to give advice about anything, but I, I suppose now it's about just continuing in however, in, in whatever way you can. So continuing to feed yourself with ideas, however, however someone finds that most effective, you know, whether it's looking, reading, sketching, trying things on chopping things up just don't do the hoovering too much which is displacement um <laughs> because it's frustrating not being able to you know start something in the way that you're used to and try to 
you know, make it come out somewhere. And in the end, when you're a fashion designer, you make something to be worn by someone else. So I think, you know, when we come out of the other side of this, there'll be a sort of explosion of creativity from people who've been making while this is, you know, making ideas really while we've been thwarted in making, in realizing them. So that, that would be my, my recommendation. Tenacity and keep and keep keep on keep on doing it. I love the idea that when all this is ended, there'll be an explosion of of creative uh, realization and uh, and design, uh, and and and, and uh, human um, well pr the production or the result of human creativity. Finally, do you have a question for uh, the audiences who who be listening and watching this? Um, well, I did think of a question, which is, do you find that you're dressing in a particular way during this lockdown. And um, that's, what I, that's what I wondered. I know I am. I know I'm not just going around in my dressing gown. That would really kill my feeling of continuity, which is essential during this time. So I'd love to know what people, what outfits they're their, uh, you know, how they're working their outfits um, under lockdown. That's a great question. I remember reading somewhere you said that your customer was someone who was, who was happy to show off discreetly. So let's hope it, that the people listening in are happy to show off discreetly and share with us in answer to your question, how they're dressing during lockdown and, and, and whether there's a kind of uh, a different style being adopted or whether people want to just dress up on occasion. Because mm. as you point out, if you just spend your day in your pyjamas, uh, all hours seem to merge into one. Yeah, because I, uh, I was... I've got a dog, so I'm able to take him for a walk. And I was, the other day I was just getting into a rather drab combo. And then, and then I thought about my friend Susie Cave and remembered when I'd last seen her, she was wearing a pair of my silver track pants with her beautiful clothes. And, and I thought, God, I must make more effort and you know, get into a better outfit. And so, and it, it really did a good job, it made me feel great and relaxed and um, uh, I, in the end clothes are good for the morale they're good for the spirits you put something on and then you can just forget about it and you know I was re I was looking at an interview also that um, Vivian Westwood was doing with Naomi Campbell I think it was on Vogue.com or Naomi's thing and and Vivian was talking about activism as usual and she said if you want to get your point across, you need to be wearing a really good outfit. And I totally agree. I think design will get your message across if, if the design is good. It will really help people to receive it.